Hello, welcome, thank you for joining me in the beginning of this new playlist. I am doing this personally for myself. I want to do it with many people on the channel as we keep growing in this faith-based channel, preparing ourselves for the imminent triumph of the Immaculate Heart. There are many consecration books out there, including the 33-day consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, consecrations to St. Joseph, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, and the one I've decided I felt in the last uh, couple of weeks coming more and more to mind is why not do the 33 days to greater glory? And of course, it is a total consecration to the Father through Jesus based on the Gospel of St. John. Each day for the next 33 days, we will do a little meditation based on a certain scripture passage of St. John's Gospel, followed by the author giving himself his own, giving us his own words, and then finishing with a little snippet of prayer. I just want to introduce this to you, something that I have done myself uh, a few years ago, at a time where I wasn't best practicing my faith after leaving seminary, believe it or not, taking a downward spiral spiritually, mentally, even physically to the point I wasn't looking after myself in any way, shape or form. And amidst a few years of anxiety, depression and everything else, I, I don't know why I decided to do this consecration, is because I was becoming more alien to the Lord. And that's a topic for another day. Perhaps I'll share my testimony with you in full. And uh, many things along the way it's helped get me back on the right path. So I know what it's like to be with the Lord. I know what it's like to be without Him. I know what it's like to be back with Him. And I choose to be with Him always. But when I did this uh, consecration a couple of years ago or so, it led up uh, towards Christmas again when I decided to do it. And I have to say, amidst all the the badness and the depression, anxiety and everything else going on inside, the way I could describe what it felt like at the very last day of doing this consecration was such a, a sense of an internal peace that was so gentle, so uninvasive that if I didn't recognise it in a moment that I did in church, I would have missed it. It was so gentle. And that to me was getting to a depth that I've never experienced before. And that peace was something deeper and deeper to the point where I knew it was God the Father himself. It was the slightest little touch. And from there, things started getting better very quickly. So I bring this introduction to you. I'm going to start straight in with day one. You can get this on Kindle edition as I have. We're going to read the passage highlighted each day, followed by the author's words and the final prayer. So without further ado, let's begin on day one. 33 days to greater glory. 33 days of scripture reading, meditation and prayer. We're praying specifically for the peace in the world and a personal total consecration to our Heavenly Father through Jesus. This is coming from the 33 Days to Greater Glory book by Michael E. Gately. Day 1, we will read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him. 
yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Commentary from the author Do not come near. Thus God spoke to Moses from a bush that burned with a fire that did not consume it. But while Moses was not allowed to draw near, he still got to behold the glorious sight and had the privilege of hearing the voice of the Lord, the all-powerful Word of God. And what did that Word reveal? It revealed God's compassion and mercy, for God said, I have seen the affliction of my people and have heard their cry. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. And the word also revealed that name of God, I am who am. That divine name, full of power and life, like the burning bush, is aflame with existence without needing any fuel from which to draw its power. For God himself is. God himself is existence. God himself is power and life, the source of all life and all that is. That merciful, all-powerful God then used Moses to deliver the people of Israel from their slavery in Egypt, leading them across the Red Sea to Mount Sinai in the desert. And on the third day at Sinai, God called Moses to the top of the mountain, which was shrouded in smoke because the glory of the Lord descended on top of it like a consuming fire. But that fire did not consume Moses, who received the law as a spark to set God's people alight with a burning love for their God. In response to the word of the law, God's people proclaimed, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. But they were not obedient. For when Moses returned to the top of the mountain, the people made a god of their own, a golden calf, and worshipped it instead of the only god. At that God's anger flared up, but Moses interceded, and the Lord relented of the punishment he had planned. Why? Because, as the Lord said to Moses, he is a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy and faithfulness. And the one to whom God showed the greatest mercy of all was Moses himself. For Moses enjoyed an intimacy with God unlike anyone else on the face of the earth. After all, it was to Moses that God revealed his name, to Moses that God spoke as with a friend, to Moses that God granted the familiarity of face-to-face -face dialogue, though without actually seeing God's face. Having already tasted the sweetness of the Lord and his friendship, Moses longed for more. He pined for more. And so, despite those earlier words of the Lord from the bush, do not come near, Moses did draw near as he expressed his desires in a heartfelt plea to the Lord. I beg you, show me your glory. Sadly, God could not grant that prayer. To see the fullness of his glory would be to see his face, and to see God's face would have consumed poor Moses, as the Lord himself explained. 
you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. But God loved Moses, and in his great tenderness he revealed to him as much glory as the man could bear, saying, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand upon the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord's back. That was the most glory ever revealed to man up to that point. It was the limit decreed by God, and yet our good and gracious God strove to give Moses even more. He did so by revealing the promise of a greater glory. And even though Moses himself would not see it in this life, he could at least become the messenger to point to it. And he is indeed that messenger precisely when he writes in Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. And how would that future prophet be like Moses? He would speak with God face to face. And how would that prophet experience a greater glory? He would not just speak with God face to face, but would actually see God's face. As Pope Benedict XVI explains, the promise from Moses of a prophet like me implicitly contains an even greater expectation that the last prophet, the new Moses, will be granted what was refused to the first one, a real immediate vision of the face of God and thus the ability to speak entirely from seeing, not just from looking at God's back. Jesus is that prophet the one with a real immediate vision of the face of God. And more than a prophet, Jesus himself is the Word become flesh, the Word who was with God and the Word who is God. So, he doesn't just see God, he is God. He's the only begotten Son of God who's in the bosom of the Father, and he shares with us where he is from, what he has seen, and who God is. The conclusion to the prologue of John's Gospel summarises it best. No one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. That last phrase describes Jesus' mission, his passion, and his purpose. It's to make the Father known and loved, to reveal the truth about God, to allow us to see what Moses could not see. The glorious face of the Father shining forth from the face of Christ, revealing not only the truth about God, but also the truth about ourselves, as we'll learn tomorrow. Today's prayer. I beg you, Father, show me your glory. Show me your face. Let me behold your glory shining forth from the face of Christ. Amen.